Rising to fame in the early 70s, Alice Cooper was Rock's first villain. His bloody stage antics and outrageous persona made him beloved by kids and hated by parents. But behind the scenes, it was all just an act put on by a surprisingly regular guy. This is the crazy real-life story of Alice Cooper. The man who had become the godfather of shock rock was born Vincent Fernier on February 4, 1948 in Detroit, Michigan. A self-described all-American kid, Alice Cooper grew up an avid baseball fan and continues to love the game to this day. In his 2007 memoir, Golf Monster, Cooper explained, I lived for baseball. When the sun came up, I grabbed my glove and I was ready to play until the sun went down, when you couldn't see the ball anymore and it was time to rush home for dinner. The only downside to Cooper's happy childhood was his frequent bouts of asthma. On doctor's orders, the Ferniers left Detroit for the drier climates of Los Angeles and later settled permanently in Phoenix, Arizona. The Beatles' American TV debut was a transformative experience for young Vincent Fernier. Cooper wrote in Golf Monster, I came to school the day after they played the Ed Sullivan show, and it was as if a weird revolution had struck the students. The Beatles were the ultimate catalyst for me to try my own hand at music. Years before he became an icon wearing makeup on stage, Fernier started his music career by wearing a Beatles wig. He and his friends called themselves the Earwigs and performed parodies of Beatles songs at his high school. However, that tiny taste of rock stardom inspired them to take music seriously. Changing their name to The Spiders, the band graduated to playing school dances and then small clubs. Soon, they were the stars of the Phoenix music scene. With guitarist Michael Bruce, the band recorded its first single, a psychedelic garage rock masterpiece, Don't Blow Your Mind, was a regional hit, reaching number one on local radio's top 40 charts. Fernier and the band decided to take a chance and leave the comfortable confines of Phoenix for Los Angeles. By the time they reached LA, the young musicians were flat broke. Their luck eventually changed when they were booked as the house band for LA's Cheetah Club. There, they started crossing paths with future legends, such as The Doors and Janis Joplin, just to name a couple. Changing their name to The Naz, the band started to take their music and their stage show in a new avant-garde direction. After discovering the name The Naz was already being used by musician Todd Rundgren for his group, Fernier and friends held a brainstorming session to come up with a new moniker. The first suggestion, Husky Baby Sandwich, was definitely out. For years, how the Naz became Alice Cooper was shrouded in mystery. The most persistent legend states that Alice Cooper was the name of a 13th century witch who had been burned at the stake. Allegedly, her spirit contacted the band during a late night session with a Ouija board. That's all hooey. According to Cooper, the band's name came without any supernatural influence. He wrote in Golf Monster, The first name out of my mouth was a girl's name, Alice Cooper. By the end of the night, the name kind of stuck. I conjured up an image of a little girl with a lollipop in one hand and a butcher knife in the other. Lizzie Borden, Alice Cooper, they had a similar ring. Reinvented as Alice Cooper, the band overhauled their image to match their spooky name. With the help of LA girl group the GTOs, the band created a sinister, gender-bending new look. Influenced by the horror classic Whatever Happened to Baby Jane and Jane Fonda's campy sci-fi flick Barbarella, Alice Cooper's style was heavy on makeup, leather, and lingerie. Impressed by Alice Cooper's freak show reputation, Frank Zappa signed the band to his record label. With a record contract in hand, the band realized they needed professional management. Securing the services of Shep Gordon, Alice Cooper was finally ready to conquer the world. Although their first two psychedelic-tinged albums failed to connect with critics and fans, their 1971 album Love It to Death signaled a change in both Alice Cooper's direction and their fortunes. Under the guidance of producer Bob Ezrin, Alice Cooper became a hard rock hit-making phenomenon. Released in November 1970, I'm 18, Love It to Death's anthemic first single was a top 40 hit, with the album itself peaking at number 35 on the Billboard charts. Alice Cooper had at last achieved their long-simmering musical dreams. The band's next album, Killer, fared even better than Love It to Death, reaching a chart position of 21. It featured such classic tracks as Under My Wheels and Be My Lover. Alice Cooper followed Killer with 1972's Schools Out, their most successful effort yet. The album's title track, a raucous tribute to high school rebellion and sprinting into summer, peaked at number 7. 
The song has since become an indelible piece of pop culture. Covered by such artists as Rob Zombie and the Foo Fighters, Schools Out captures what Cooper has called life's three best minutes, those suspenseful moments waiting for the last school bell to ring before summer vacation. Alice Cooper's next album, 1973's Billion Dollar Babies, transcended even the success of Schools Out. Conceived as a spoof of their overnight success, the album was the band's crowning creative and commercial achievement. The Billion Dollar Babies tour featured Alice Cooper's most elaborate show to date, a spectacle filled with snakes, blood-filled baby dolls, a rain of billion-dollar bills, and the nightly execution of Alice by guillotine. The tour stunned fans and upset parents all over the world. I love, I love making parents mad. Obviously, it would be hard to top Billion Dollar Babies, and the band's next album, Muscle of Love, was a back-to-basics rock album. Featuring stripped-down production and comparatively conventional arrangements, the record failed to reach the level of its predecessors. Alice and his bandmates, worn out from years of constant touring and recording, decided it was time for a break. Although it was intended to be a temporary hiatus, the band's breakup proved permanent. Although Alice Cooper the band was finished in 1974, Alice Cooper the solo artist was just getting started. Cooper's first solo release, 1975's Welcome to My Nightmare, is composed as a horrifying trip through the bad dreams of a little boy named Steven. Free of the constraints of a band, Cooper could further develop his rock and roll villain persona as well as explore themes and musical genres outside the hard rock milieu. One of the album's biggest stylistic departures is the ballad Only Women Bleed. Touching on the topic of domestic abuse, the song reveals Cooper's underappreciated skills as both a lyricist and singer. Rounding out Welcome to My Nightmare's horrific vibe is an appearance by Vincent Price, who gives an unhinged and classic spoken word performance. With renewed focus, Cooper and manager Shep Gordon put up their own money to fund the Welcome to My Nightmare tour. A potentially disastrous move, their gamble paid off. Upping the theatricality of the show far beyond anything he'd done previously, Cooper's expensive nightmare show featured dancers, costumes, giant props, illusions, a cyclops, and an interactive movie screen, and it was a massive success. Cooper, rarely photographed without a beer in his hand throughout the 70s, had spent much of his career as a functional alcoholic. So you have to be <laughs> drunk when you are Alice. Yeah, you have to be drunk to put up with Alice. Cooper's wife, Cheryl, spoke frankly about her husband's struggle in a VH1 interview conducted in 1999. There didn't seem to be an obvious problem. If he were falling down or abusive, I think attention would have been paid much more quickly. Agreeing with his wife, Cooper said, I denied it for an awful long time. I wasn't a cruel drunk. I wasn't a stupid drunk. I was just a drinker. However, by 1977, Cooper's drinking was obviously affecting his performances and, more importantly, his health. Committed to a mental health facility, Cooper got clean and sober but soon relapsed. According to Cooper's book, Golf Monster, the rocker doesn't remember recording his early 80s records because he was in a continuous alcoholic fog. Malnourished and near death, Cooper checked into a hospital in September 1983. Struggling back from the brink, Cooper's recovery from alcoholism was nothing short of a miracle. Cooper wrote, When I left the hospital, I felt strange, like I had never been an alcoholic, and more important, like I would never be one again. Something had happened inside of me. After battling his way back from alcoholism, Cooper spent the next three years reconnecting with his wife and children, getting healthy, and getting back in touch with his Christian faith. During this period of recovery, returning to the stage and assuming the role of his sinister alter ego were definitely low on his list of priorities. In fact, the prospects of a comeback were downright scary to the veteran shock rocker. The thought of going back up on stage and doing Alice without being uh, anesthetized was pretty frightening. Nevertheless, Cooper returned in 1986 with Constrictor, his ninth solo album. A flashy 80s metal affair, the record put Cooper back on the musical map. Energized and sober, Cooper also mounted his first tour in years. Donning his famous black leather and makeup, Alice Cooper once again ruled the stage as rock's dark prince. Cooper's 1980s return couldn't have come at a better time. With the mainstream popularity of heavy metal at an all-time high, he was definitely back in his element. Plus, Cooper was respected as an elder statesman of rock and roll, with plenty of knowledge to impart. Isn't Milwaukee an Indian name? Yes, Pete, it is. Actually, it's pronounced Miliwake. 
which is Algonquin for the good land. Along with his faith, Alice Cooper credits his love of golf as the key to conquering his demons. Cooper began playing the sport in 1973. Although he played for a decade, Alice Cooper truly dedicated himself to golf in 1983. As part of his recovery from alcoholism, he decided to seriously study the game and master its intricacies. Spending virtually every day on the golf course playing, on average, 36 holes a day, Cooper was in the throes of an all-new addiction. In 2007, Cooper told ContactMusic.com that it was no surprise that he and fellow rock and roll survivors got hooked on golf. Cooper further explained, Every guy I know, from Lou Reed to Bob Dylan to Neil Young, they all play golf. It's because they were all drug users or alcoholics, and I think golf is so addictive that it's just like taking drugs. Even though Cooper openly jokes about being hooked on golf, his wife Cheryl is more than happy with this form of addiction. He always tells me he traded one bad habit for another one. Oh, I think this is a much better habit. More than music or golf, the center of Alice Cooper's life is his family. Married for over 40 years, Cooper met Cheryl Goddard when she joined the Welcome to My Nightmare tour as a dancer in 1975. Besides a brief period during the worst of Alice's alcoholism in the early 80s, the Coopers have been inseparable ever since. The rare, successful showbiz marriage, the Coopers credit their faith and keeping romance alive as the secrets to marital longevity. The Coopers have three adult children. The eldest daughter, Calico, is a dancer, actress, and singer who replaced her mother in Alice's act for a number of years. These days, the multi-talented artist fronts her own hard rock band, Bisto Blanco. Alice and Cheryl's son, Dash, also fronts a band. His group is called Co-op, and the Cooper's youngest daughter, Sonora Rose, works as a professional makeup artist. Cooper likes to keep his family close at hand and brings them on tour as often as possible. Now in his 70s, Alice Cooper is the ultimate rock and roll survivor. Still touring and recording, the king of shock rock has no plans of slowing down anytime soon. In 2011, Alice Cooper and the surviving members of his legendary original band received a long overdue honor when they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. In addition to his solo career, Cooper joined up with actor Johnny Depp and Aerosmith guitarist Joe Perry to create the supergroup Hollywood Vampires. Named after the 70s drinking club that included Cooper, Harry Nielsen, Keith Moon, Mickey Dolenz, and occasionally John Lennon, the band celebrates the music of rock stars who died before their time. Once cited as a corrupting influence on youth, Cooper now inspires kids through Alice Cooper's Solid Rock. This extraordinary nonprofit organization is dedicated to instilling purpose in the lives of young people through the arts. Despite famously singing No More Mr. Nice Guy, Cooper has proven himself to be one of the kindest, most giving, and enduring rock stars of the past five decades. We're not worthy! We're not worthy! We're not Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about rock stars are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.